Well, here we are, week three of a series on that which God is doing in terms of being him doing a new thing. The title of the sermon series is Behold, I Do a New Thing, taken out of Isaiah chapter 43, where God comes to a to, to Israel, a, a people who are caught in a dark place, and he's wanting to say to them that it doesn't matter how dark it is, it doesn't matter how wide or bad something has been, I have something new for you. But of course, the phrase that emerges from this text is this, that behold, I do a new thing, can you not perceive it? Because the truth is, is there can be new all around us, it's just that we may not have eyes to see the new that's there. And the newness of God, the newness of heaven, always requires a partnership on our side to partner with God. You see, the prophetic sense of this for, I think, our entire church family is that God's doing something new among us. New for families, new for individuals as you find yourself in your sphere of influence in your workplace. There's a new influence that you have there. There's going to be a new gift set as you heard last week that's released for you in your boardrooms and classrooms. A new gift set released in your small groups. A new gift set released as a Kids Hope mentor that that, 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 that there's something new among us. And sometimes this new is, is, a, is, is, an, is a, a, a further thrusting of where we're already headed. Like some of us, our rocket ships are already reaching the atmosphere. And I believe God in this season wants to just add a special booster to that. And you're going to excel and exceed in the places even more so. Turn to somebody and write and say, yeah, I'm a rocket. Not everybody did that. We'll get to you. Sometimes it's a new thing that you've never experienced before. It's a new gift that emerges. It's a new anointing that you've never sensed before. It's a new door that's opened up to you that you've never seen before. But sometimes it's not a new thing that we've never experienced. Sometimes it's God deepens and widens what's already present. But maybe we've not experienced that thing like we have before. I believe our church is that a place for both? There are some new things in store for us as a church, us as individuals, and there is some deepening and widening of places that we have had a taste of, but he wants a full course meal for us. As I was, as I was, was uh, 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 praying for this weekend, I, I, I saw this picture of a long hallway that has had a multitude of doors down the hallway. And some of these doors had new relationships, some of these on the doors said, relationships and ministries and giftings and it just some of the fruit of the spirit some of the gifts of the spirit there just were all kinds of new stuff and I walked up to the door and I tried to get into one of the doors and I couldn't get in I'm jiggling the handle didn't open up and and I'm trying to like find is there like a special key code that I use my intellect to figure out how to get in couldn't happen so then I tried to do my very best Ralph Macchio impression karate kid and chop the door down also didn't help just hurt my foot so here I am standing with a sense that God was beckoning me into something that was new. I'm standing outside of this door. I think I've chosen wisely the door for me to walk through, but I can't get in to the other side. And I stand growingly frustrated that I can't access the new that I know I'm supposed to have. Are anybody with me with this one? I heard the Lord say to me, look down at your hand, Joel. And so I looked down at my hand, and there was like one of those really old school skeleton keys. They had like two prongs at the end. I don't know how like that actually worked somewhere, but it did. And he said, put the key in. And as I looked down at the key, I saw that written on the key was the word mercy. And I put it in the door and I turned it and the door instantly opened up to me. And this was the sense that I got for us as a church this weekend is there are new things assuredly that God wants to bring us into. And those are all those doorways. But in order for us to get to the new, we must have the gift of mercy in our hand. If you're taking notes today, please write this down. The title of today's sermon is Mercy for the New. You see, mercy is a defining characteristic of God's covenant with us. Everything that he does flows in and out of mercy. 
He comes in salvation with mercy. He comes with gifts of mercy. He heals us with mercy. He restores us with mercy. He, he, he gives us what we didn't ask for for mercy. It all flows in and out of mercy. In fact, God in, 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 in the Old Testament names his covenant with us with this word in the English essentially meaning mercy. It was Bartimaeus' cry for mercy that stopped heaven in its tracks and caused Jesus to alter his plans. Son of David, have mercy for me. Shut up, Bartimaeus. Son of David, have mercy for me. Shut up, Bartimaeus. Son of David, have mercy for me. And it's the cry for mercy that stops Jesus and says, who's talking to me? And then everybody gets real smart. Oh, Bartimaeus, he's talking to you. Come on, man. You see, mercy is always the cry that gets answered. Because mercy is the currency of heaven coming and going. Your exchange rate for anything you got can never be greater than that of mercy. And here's the reality. Mercy is most commonly seen, not in your highest of highs. Mercy is most clearly seen in the darkest of moments of our souls. Like a candle taken from a noonday moment to the midnight hour covered up by trees that can be seen from miles away. This is what mercy does for us. And I believe what God's wanting to say to so many of our families, so many of our hearts is, yes, you've heard the word new. Yes, you've heard the word new. And some of us have said, but I am so deep, so far, so removed, I'm not certain that his mercy can find me. And the word today for our hearts as a church is mercy not only can find you, mercy wants to find you, mercy is finding you. And if we are willing to receive that mercy, an entire new horizon is opened up to us for what God has for us. If you're ready to receive some fresh mercy, somebody say amen. amen. Our text for today comes out of Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations was written to Israel at the time of the maybe one of their lowest moments. Written in about 580 B.C. roughly. Jeremiah pens this book. Now, a quick context to this. Israel has lived in their own sin. And because of their sin, they're walking away from covenant. God has allowed the Babylonians to come in. Their city is destroyed. Their families have been torn apart. Fa members killed. Women and, and daughters raped. They, 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 they now stand outside of this gateway. And everybody walking by them sees how much ruin they're in. And a whole chunk of them now have been actually exiled and don't even live in the own land that they were in. And it's to this context that what happens is the women of Israel began to wail and cry about the state of their being. And the majority of lamentations, these six chapters, are actually Jeremiah compiling these songs of lament of the women and the mothers and the wives of Israel about their current state. And he brings them all together. And then, right smack dab. In the middle of this are the only verses that we believe are Jeremiah's own pen and own hand. And this is what he writes. Verse 19, chapter 3. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them. And my soul is downcast within me. My feeling is at home and here in the room, I think I'm describing some of us today. Yet this, verse 21, I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Hope in the face of loss. Hope in the face of despair. Hope in the face of every door shutting shut on you. Hope in the face of no job applications coming about. Hope in the face of someone saying something to you and cussing you out. Hope in the place of a relationship gone bad. Hope in the place of a doctor's report not right. Hope in the place of a prodigal son or daughter gone away. Hope in this place. Why do we have hope? Because this is what Jeremiah would say. Verse 22, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. Some translations are going to say because of his great mercies. For his compassions, his longings, his desirings for us, they fail not. Verse 23, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And I will say to myself, somebody got to say something to yourself about yourself. 
The Lord is my portion, and therefore I will wait on God. Come on, the first thing that we see here in our text is that mercy is not afraid of your past. Sometimes I think we think mercy can only come as long as I don't talk about my past. Like if it didn't know about them skeletons in the closet, then I could have mercy. If, 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 God, if God could forget about what I did, then I could receive mercy. Jeremiah doesn't pull any punches here in Lamentations. He lets Israel know who Israel is. Mercy doesn't shy away from what's really happening in your life. Hashtag mercy is not scared. It's not scared of what you've done. Mercy is not scared of that cycle of addiction that you're in. Mercy is not scared of those decisions you made last week or last night. It knows what's happening. And mercy also doesn't deny what's taking place. Hashtag real talk. Some of us aren't willing to actually say what's going on and thus aren't able to receive the mercy that we could have. Because mercy requires you to admit your need for mercy. But mercy, when it talks about our past, when it even talks about our present, it speaks about what's to come, and that is the goodness of God. Lamentations 3, I remember my affliction and my wandering and, my, and the bitterness. Verse 20, I well remember them, just in case you forgot, Jeremiah's going to help you remember two verses in a row. You see, Jeremiah is speaking to a people who are dealing with the painful ramifications of themselves. Family, let's be honest. Sometimes we get ourselves in the mess that we are in. Like, like sometimes stuff happens, things take place out of your control, that boss, that person, that thing that you had no control over, and it happened. And sometimes we happen to ourselves. Out of our stupidity, out of our ignorance, out of our selfishness, out of our pride, out of our wandering of our own hearts, we move away from where God would have and we find ourselves in all kinds of sin and stuff. And Jeremiah is saying, even though you got yourself in a mess, mercy is still greater than your bad decision. It isn't as if God only gives mercy to those who have had stuff happen to them. In fact, as we see in our text in Micah, it says that he not only gives mercy, he delights in giving mercy upon forgiving the transgressions of your heart and life. He loves to give mercy. And it is greater than the past event of your life. Yet shame is what keeps us from receiving the mercy of God. If you're having notes, write this down. We cannot receive mercy and live in shame at the same time. Shame is a lid that keeps the mercy of God of coming into your life. Because shame says, I don't deserve the thing that I should get from God. Shame says, I'm not worthy of this. Shame says that my past is too great. He can't possibly come get me. Shame says, I have been gone too long. I've been too far. I've been too derelict. Wasted too much stuff of my life. Assuredly, mercy can't redeem all of that. It's why every one of us are candidates for mercy. Because every one of us are jacked up. Turn to someone on your right and say, I know you jacked up though. You see, maybe your darkest moment is actually the brightest moment of his mercy for you. You see, his mercy is greater than your past. Your failures are not your identity. They're just events. That, that relationship that ended disastrously, that's not your identity. That's just a past event. That, that, that business that you sabotage out of your own foolishness is just an event. That school program, that scholarship money that you squandered is just an event. It's not your identity. 
that, that, that failure, that cycle of behavior, that addiction that you keep going in is not your identity. It's just the current struggle. And if we're going to receive mercy for all of those areas, we've got to turn off the shame identity issue and just say, that was my past. This may even be my present, but mercy says it's greater than what is and what has been. The word that that Jeremiah uses in verse 19 is this word remember. And it isn't just recalling something. That's what he uses in verse 20. It's specific to a group of people. Meaning this, the form that he uses in the Hebrew says, I remember that I am still God's people. Yes, I remember the distress, but I remember the distress of God's people. I remember the hardship of God's people. I remember the pain of God's people. I remember the failed events of God's people. Your failed events cannot remove you from being a covenantal one of God. And if we're going to receive new mercies for today, we must rest in the fact that you cannot change your identity as a son and daughter of God. If you're in a dark place, have hope. This is the moment of mercy for you. If you're battling your sense of identity in him, have hope. This is the day of mercy for you where he, where he solidifies, you are my child, you are my daughter, and you can't even mess that up. So if you got some closets in the, excuse me, if you got some skeletons in your closet, rejoice. You are, you are not that skeleton, and you are a candidate for mercy. But see, it isn't just that mercy is greater than your past. What Jeremiah helps us see here is that mercy actually equals his love's pursuit for us. Maybe your failure isn't just something for him to get over and forgive you for. But maybe your failure is actually a portal to receive his pursuit of your life. You see, I so often translate my failures with, okay, God will forgive me. And it's like, it's like we enter into like a neutral space. Rather than seeing my jacked up self as actually God uses that failed event of my life to help me see, no, no, no. I actually progress in you because in my failed event that you give mercy for, I see how much you are pursuing me. Last week, I'm totally jacked up, a one-on-one conversation, one of our staff members. I mean, I sensed the entire time Holy Spirit saying, don't do it, 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 don't say that, don't say that, don't say that. And I did it, I did it, I did it, I said it, I said it, I said it. And the moment I did it, I'm like, I just felt Holy Spirit say, really, Joel? So I did my whole repenting gig with the person and God. And in retrospect, I'm like, God, thank you for giving my sin. Thank you for making us, you know, okay now. I just sensed the Lord say, no, no, you got this differently. This didn't just help you get over and me forgive your thing. In this moment, your lack of self-control of your mouth actually is a space when I forgive and restore you is a place that you will see that I will come in fresh measures to your life. You see, maybe your past failed event isn't just a failed event to be forgiven. Maybe it's actually a doorway for you to encounter in a deeper way his pursuit of your life. You see, it's, it's while we were sinners, Ephesians 2 would say, that God, rich in mercy, pursues us and saves us. See, Jeremiah is clear. He does not give Israel any place to hide from their sin. And Israel's sin is materialized by their city being in ruin, by them being destitute and poor and naked sitting outside of their city gates that everybody that walks by can see who they are. And it says in verse 17, chapter 1, Zion, speaking of Israel, reaches out her hands and asks someone to help and no one comforts her. Because, verse 17 says, Jerusalem has become an unclean 
Now there are a few kids in the room. I'll just say this. This word unclean that Jesus uses is the word for a menstrual rag used to clean a woman up. Now Jeremiah is doing something very specific to this. Israel had some particular purity rituals. If you were dead, couldn't touch the dead person. If you had blood of any capacity, you couldn't touch that person. And particularly for a woman in this place, you couldn't. And if you were a leper, you couldn't. Because Israel understood this. The unclean thing made the clean thing unclean. You catch that? The unclean thing made the clean thing unclean. It's why the, in the Good Samaritan story, the priest and the Levite won't touch the person laying next to them. It's also why in Matthew 8, the leper says to Jesus, are you willing to clean me? The issue was not ability. The issue was willingness. Jesus, the Messiah, are you willing to touch me who is unclean? Not can you. Will you? And Jesus' response is not I can. Jesus' response is I'm willing to. Our moments of our failed events, our places of needing mercy is not just can I redeem your past, it's I'm willing to redeem your past. I'm willing to touch you. You see, the ability to and the willingness to are two different things. I can give my daughter ice cream every single day, but will I? Nuh uh. I could give her her entire 37 list of toys that she wants. Will I? Nuh uh. Until she asks her mom, and then her mom will. However, <laughs> Jeremiah is driving us to see in this that God's mercy isn't just powerful enough to touch you, but it actually wants to. It actually longs to pour out fresh mercy. Because this is how he continues. Lamentations 3. This I call to mind. After I remembered how dirty I am. After I remembered how much I have lost. After I remember all of my sin stuff. This is, what I, well, this is what I recall to mind. This is what I have hope in. Because of your great mercy. Because of your great mercy, I am not consumed. And because of your compassions, this word that he uses means the tender love or longing for. That they never cease to stop. His pursuit of your life never stops just because you said, I don't want it. And if we're going to receive fresh mercy, it comes off the confession of our lives that he can touch me and he wants to touch me. And my sense is some of us are battling receiving mercy because we're just unsure that he can. But secondarily, some of us are battling receiving mercy because we're just not sure that he wants to. I hear the Lord saying to a number of us today, not only can I, but I want to. Will you receive the power and the willingness of my mercy in this season? What I want to do for just a moment is just to pray on this. Now, we are a safe family. We all got stuff. Turn to somebody, say, I got some stuff. Turn to somebody else, say, I know you got stuff. See, we all got skeletons. Every one of us got some junk in the trunk. It's okay. If you would say today, I am struggling in believing that God can or wants to give me mercy. And I want that lid taken off my life. Would you just stand up right where you are? We're just going to pray. If you're online, please designate yourself as this as well. We want to pray with you. If you're in the room right now and you just say, I just need, I need this lid taken off. I know it. I've got some identity issues, some shame issues, my past stuff. I... I'm tired of striving in my past. He wants to. It's not just that he can, it's that he wants to. Anybody else? Anybody else? New mercies today for us if we'll receive it. If somebody is standing up around you, would you just quickly place your hands on their back where they are? Come on, if you've got to move around the sanctuary... Or if you're in your living room and somebody's standing next to you, go ahead and just get right to them. 
Real quickly, real quickly, real quickly. We're going to pray for a fresh sense of identity. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Father in heaven, I ask that you come right now. That you would give by your spirit a fresh dose of mercy. And would your words speak to your people. You are mine and nothing would change that. Not your sin, not your past. Fresh mercies poured out by your spirit. God of mercy and grace, we come to you. Jesus, you sit on a throne of mercy and grace that in our time of need, we can ask for it. And I ask now, would they hear your voice say, child, not only can I, but I will. Not only will I, but I want to. And would you break loose and shatter every word of the enemy that says they have disqualified themselves from fresh mercy. That thing is not who you are. And Lord, we receive now Fresh mercy. They're new every morning. Your faithfulness, your faithfulness, your faithfulness is as proven as the sun coming up over the horizon. And your fresh mercies never come to an end. You never run out of mercy for us. And we can ask time and time and time again. We receive it now in your name we pray. If you receive that, would you say amen? Lastly, as we finish, Jeremiah shows us one more thing. It is, it is not obvious, but I believe it's implied. If you're taking notes, write this down. Fresh getting requires fresh giving. If shame is the lid that keeps mercy out, then not giving mercy to others is the hole in the bucket that lets it out the bottom. There is a general kingdom principle where the kingdom of heaven is circular. You give what you receive and you receive what you give. And we, if we want to receive in the measure, let me say it this way, we receive in the measure that we give. And we give in the measure that which we have received. When Jesus is teaching in the Beatitudes... He's teaching about what the kingdom of heaven is like and not like. And he, he's teaching uh, 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 about several kingdom characteristics. And this is what he says about mercy. He says, those who give mercy receive mercy. To the measure that I give out is the measure by which I'm willing to receive. And in our spaces of refusing to give mercy, we burrow a hole in our bucket and we can't even keep the mercy that we get. In fact, the places, I think, in the kingdom of heaven that we struggle to receive are probably the places in our life that we refuse to give. Jeremiah, in our text here in verse 24, says, and I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Now, prior to this, he has said that your mercies are new every morning. In fact, Jeremiah would define the faithfulness of God not in his provision, not in his healing, not in anything in the natural. Jeremiah would say, this is how I know God is faithful because every morning, assuredly, as the sun comes up over the horizon, I get mercies. And the word that he uses here is a word of inheritance. It's my portion implied is that somebody else gave me my inheritance. You know, you can't get your own inheritance. Somebody's got to give it to you. And my sense is this the premise that Jeremiah, I think, is weaving into some things is that if you want fresh mercies, we must give fresh mercies. I was reminded of the book of Jonah, one of my favorite texts. 
Probably because I'm stubborn like Jonah, so I like him. Jonah chapter 1, he's called to go to Nineveh, a group of people whom he hates. They have done atrocious things to them. He says, nah, -uh, I don't want them to have any kind of mercy. So chapter, and chapter 1, he gets on a ship and a big old fish swallows him up. Chapter 2, he's in the belly of that fish and decides that's not a great place to be. So chapter 3, he gets spit up. He goes to Nineveh, and this is what he says to Nineveh. Y'all going to die, deuces. <laughs> Sits on a hill and waits for him to die. What happens is that Nineveh actually repents and receives the mercy of God. And he gets all kind of upset about this. And this is what he says in chapter 4. After he sees the salvation and the great mercy of God, he says, isn't this what I said what happened to you? I tried to forestall this by running away because I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, that you were slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from calamity. And then he says this, now take away my life, for it is better for me to die than these people to receive mercy. When we refrain from giving people mercy, it is the slow poisoning of our life. That person who you struggle with so much is the person that is the gateway to you receiving mercy in fresh measures. I got some of them folk who I struggled with. You know, sometimes that person is like distance. It's like a kid's hope kid. You got to give up some time to get to them. You got to give them some gas money. You got to give up a lunch break once a week. And if you're willing to transcend some time and space, and as you invest in this kid's life, all of a sudden what happens is your heart changes and you receive mercy in fresh measures. But other times it's not like a time and space journey. It's an emotional journey. That coworker that went behind your back and sent that email, that boss that said those things to you, that friend, that neighbor that lets their dog do that stuff on your yard on purpose every time, whatever it is, that person whom you are seeing their face in your mind's eye right now, that person is the gateway to mercy. And the measure by which you will give to them it's the measure by which God will return back to you. And here's the battle. It's what if I'm merciful to them and they slap me in the face? It's one particular couple, particular people in my life that I, I don't think I'm antagonistic towards. I just think I'm a little bit neutral towards. And I sense Holy Spirit say, I need you to move from neutral into a driving gear. And here's my battle. But what if I'm nice? What if I extend mercy and they still don't respond? And the Lord said to me two things. He said, number one, you ain't extending mercy for them. You extending mercy for you. And secondly, Joel, in Galatians, he says, I am not mocked. Don't you be deceived. What you sow, you will reap. And the harder and farther it is to sow seeds of mercy, the greater the harvest is of mercy. And I believe us as a family, if we are going to access the fresh mercies that God has for us, we've got to commit to a radical sowing of mercy to other people's lives, particularly the folk that you don't want to. And that is your homework assignment for the week. Find a person whose face you see right now and it's okay if it is a spouse or a parent or a child. And so this week, radical mercy. And hear these words, he is not mocked. You will reap a reward if you keep sowing mercy. Fresh receiving comes off the heels of fresh giving. Would you stand to your feet with me?